Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, Miss Leona Tate. Thank you so much for coming on and being willing to speak to the St. George's community. Um, so I've, I've given some background in, in writing to everyone. Um, so I just want to ask a couple questions uh, to give some, um, some real color to, to the story on paper. Um, so to start, can you tell, um, tell your story about November 14th, 1960, please? Well, before that date, um, I could realize, I realized things was changing. Um, things were being done differently from what I had been doing. I was doing extra activities with my teachers, especially on the weekend, um, um, extra homework, not being able to play outside with my friends as much. And so um, the only thing I could, I, I remember is that I knew I was going to a different school. I just didn't know why. And um, when I woke up that morning on November 14th, my house was filled. It was like a Christmas morning. You know, everybody, you know, we had family and friends there and everybody was doing something to help my mother get prepared. And um, everybody seemed to be in a good spirit. And all of a sudden, a black car pulled up in front of the door. And um, it got real, qu real quiet in my household real quiet and um so then i knew something was up so i remember my mother saying uh, when you get in the car sit to the back of the seat do not put your face to the window and i said okay but it was comfortable and i felt good about it because i was getting a ride to school and i had been walking 10 or 11 blocks pick up from where I left. All right, we had, we had a little technical glitch. We're picking back up. <laughs> Keep going. So when we arrived in, at, at the school and it was just people everywhere, you know, and I didn't recognize that everybody out there were white. Um, I could see police on horseback. And the only thing I could relate it to was a parade was coming because I knew a parade passed on St. Claude Avenue. And just being six years old and naive, that's that's what I thought was coming. So I wanted to know why I had to go to school and everybody else got to watch the parade. So my mother said that's not the case. So we did get to enter the building and, but no, but you know, no hassle. And um, we approached the principal's office and we was asked to take a seat on a bench that was outside of the office. And we sat on that bench practically half of the day before we were even placed in a classroom. We sat out there so long that Tessa Gale and I played hopscotch on the tiles of the floor to, you know, to move the time along. And um, I can remember it was a full body of students, you know, at school that day. And when we walked in the class, I tried to speak to a little girl and it was like I was invisible. She didn't say anything to me. She didn't look at me. She didn't do nothing. But by three o'clock, the, all their parents came and pulled all the white students out and left the three of us there and we were there alone for a year and a half, except for two brothers that lasted till the end of the week. And we never saw them because they were in another part of the um, building. But from what I understand, their family got harassed real bad. So their dad had to leave, had to pull them out and leave. Um, but it was comfortable because I came from a school that was overcrowded, but we didn't get to play outside. We couldn't, the water fountains were turned off. Whatever we ate or drink, we needed to bring with us every day. We never went into the cafeteria uh, or anything like that. We had a fantastic first grade teacher though. She just was more motherly than anything. You know, she did her job, she did her job. But um, the confinement, we, we, we were comfortable. We didn't realize that it was because it was dangerous, you know, we, we I didn't think of it as being dangerous and I don't feel like I was ever afraid because my family didn't talk around me to make me afraid. So, um, but um, that lasted a year and a half. We were in that school, just, just, the, just the three of us, just the three of us. We would um, play under, the, under a stairwell right out of the side of the classroom. And if we wanted to, we could eat our lunch there. If, if not, we, 
just sat at the desk, but we couldn't go on the side of the room where the windows were. They were all papered up. Nobody could see inside the window and we couldn't see outside the window. So, and even to try to sharpen a pencil where the pencil sharpener was on the window seal, we weren't allowed to do that. We weren't allowed to do that. We could never leave outside of a doorway without a U.S. Marshal there to receive us. But they did their jobs also. We had our parents with us for the first day, but the rest of the days we were along with them and I was very comfortable. Look forward to riding with them. Yeah. So I've been scrolling through some of these photographs. So that's, that's you, of course. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about um, you know, your, your parents and their role in all this is, is, is pretty remarkable as well. Um, and it's by no accident that you said many times that you looked so nice that day, uh, as you always did and do. Um, can you talk about that kind of leading up to it and your parents and um, them kind of putting you on the front lines of desegregation of public schools? Yeah. It was, um, my mom had a lot of support. She had family support, community support, the NAACP. But she was a brave somebody. She was very courageous. You know, she'd fight a bull if she'd have to, especially behind her, her two daughters. And um, she um, said she paid her taxes and she felt like if I could get a better education there, she, she wanted me to go there. And my dad's identity was held back for a long time because he worked in St. Bernard Parish. And a lot of our protesters came from that area. So nobody really knew or had seen him um, with him. He was a welder and a mechanic. And um, he, um, he was kind of up afraid. He was a little bit worried about it. He was a little bit worried about it. So he didn't, nobody saw him for a long time. No time. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the other um, really warming things about the story, which is full of such, uh, such disturbing things, is just the relationship among you, Gail and Tessie, um, as, as first graders and second graders, and, um, and then now as obviously as, as grown women and grandmothers and great grandmothers. Um, you kind of talk about your relationship together and how you supported one another um, during that time, and then perhaps into SEMS, which was of course a very different experience that you had later on. Well, we were well prepared to go, um, but we were always told to stick together, you know, don't go off by yourself, you know, um, no matter where you had to go, even to the restroom, we all went together. Uh, we, that created a bond between the three of us that till today, that bond is still there. And, um, but we, uh, I don't care if we just don't see each other for months at a time or years at a time. When we back together, it's like we never left each other. You know, it's just, that bond is just unbreakable. Um, we um, were transferred in third grade to Sims because McDonough 19 had become a black school. And um, this time we didn't have the marshals or the police protection that we, um, endured a lot um, at that school. It, it, it was horrific. That's what, that's the, the best word I can say for that, for that building. Um, we couldn't go in the cafeteria because either somebody was gonna spit in your food or knock it out your hand. We didn't, you know, our bond really had to work that, at, at that school. We had to go to the restrooms together. If you go to the restroom, someone's there to harass you. It was, but what made it so bad at that school, some of the teachers coerced the students to call them. Sorry, yes. another technical glitch. Keep going, please. Sims was just, just something I wouldn't want to bring any child to. I mean, you know, I would try, my mom tried letting me ride the school bus. Um, they kicked the seat in that I was sitting in. And when the little boy got ready to get off the bus, he spit in my hair. And I think that might be the worst thing that I could remember that ever happened to me. And that, that just bothers me till today. Um, but that, you know, Gail and Tessie stayed at Sims until sixth grade. I left after the third grade because we moved. We still had to go to school in the district where we lived. So I joined Ruby Bridges at, at France and 
we had more black students at France, but the tension of black and white was still there, you know. Um, yeah. Okay, I know they're starting to stop. Um, yeah, it's it's so it's so difficult to hear. Certainly, your son's ears in particular, um, and because that's such an important thing to hear. Um, golly, they, I mean, there's so many things to to talk about. Um, but uh, we'll look forward to many more times. I, I'm I'm curious, kind of one last thing. Um, it's one of the more remarkable things about you and the three of you and the TEP Center and what you're building at McDonough 19 now is that despite so much of um, you know, the, the vitriol and racism and hate that you experienced, uh, you've always clearly stated that this is a place of healing and reconciliation and education, especially education of kids. Um, and it would be helpful, it'd be great to hear you know, why you think that's just such an important thing, especially for for you know, elementary school, younger and older students to, to learn about what happened? Well, my vision came because there's, I visited a lot of schools here in New Orleans and the children just don't know the history of their own city. And um, it's like they don't appreciate those teachers, you know, there that's trying to teach them something. And I feel like if they knew how hard it was years ago to, to get a, 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 a quality education, I feel like that that would make them maybe wanna be a little bit more interested. You know, Gail, Tess and I were always sentimental about that building. And, uh, and I always told them that if I ever got my, my hand on it, it would be named after the three of us and we did. But I feel like we would, even though we didn't understand what racism was at six years old, but we were introduced to it there. And I feel like that's a place where we can come together and maybe end it, you know, and, you know, we just need to talk. We just need that dialogue. And I really feel that way. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, before we go, I'm just going to show um, something that we're both super proud of. Um, this is the, the front of the old McDonough 19, now the Tate Etienne Prevost Center, uh, reopening soon, which will have an interpretive center run by your organization, as well as an anti-racism training space by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and uh, 24, 25 apartments uh, that are affordable for seniors. Um, this is the old cafeteria building you talked about you were not, you excluded from, um, mm -hmm. now been rebuilt. This is where the future home of where the interpretive center will be downstairs. Um, you described the, the first day sitting outside the you know, principal's office this is that entryway um, and where that space was and will be also part of the interpretive center. And something that's so important is that visitors will get to walk up the same 18 steps to the, up the front of the school um, and then experience really that, that first day that you, Gail and Tessie had, um, their hallway photo. Uh, and of course, there are a lot more. Um, Leona, um, we, we, um, we hope that this is Kind of the start of an engagement with you and the foundation to come to St. George's when, when the pandemic allows uh, and meet with you know mm -hmm. students and educators, something I know that you really enjoy um, and are particularly good at. Um, and uh, just, you know, you're someone who means so much to me. And uh, I'm just I mean, I'm really thankful that you would share some of your story uh, with the community of St. George's. I sure um, will. And look forward to, to more to come. I Thank am you. too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>